Okay, good morning everyone. It's good to be back uh, this morning. Uh, you, good morning uh, as we continue our study from... Good, good morning, good morning, Charles. Uh, so let us continue our study. Uh, before we go ahead, uh, does anyone have any question, any thoughts that you want to share? I know I've been, uh, you know, we've been doing this whole thing. I've been doing most of the talking. Uh, but if any of you have any thoughts, any questions? I think yesterday uh, uh, I missed to check the chat, but I saw a question there uh, regarding Luke. I don't know if it was Charles. Was it you who posted the question? Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. it was me. I was asking whether he was a Jew. Okay. So, uh, Luke was a Gentile believer. Uh, now, we don't know when, where, and how he, uh, you know, got to uh, become a believer. So there are different views. Some of them say, okay, Luke may have been, uh, you know, uh, become a believer during the Pentecost time, right? Uh, another view says, you know, it would have been in Galatia when Paul went in his first missionary journey. Uh, it's most probably that, you know, Luke became a believer there. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, there is no account of when and where he became a believer. All we know is in Galatia, uh, Luke joined Paul uh, in the uh, missionary journey. So, uh, no, he was a Gentile. And another reason why people say he was a Gentile is because um, when he wrote the book of Luke, he addressed it to the Gentiles. Uh, the, the the letter of Luke is written to the Gentiles. So uh, he was a Gentile, but we don't know when and where uh, and how he accepted the Lord. Um, so these are the different views. Either uh, some say Jerusalem, some say it was in uh, Galatia when Paul went on his first missionary journey. So, okay, uh, let's, uh, let's just refresh ourselves of what we did yesterday. We entered into the first missionary journey. We looked at Paul, how wonderfully he went into Galatia. He planted so many wonderful churches, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. Uh, now, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, not, not to all the churches Paul wrote letters. So, uh, you know, uh, you will hear of churches, you know, for example, the Perga, church at Perga, uh, or a church at Lystra. So, these churches, Paul has not written a letter, but he has done a work in these places, right? Uh, uh, and and also we looked at how the first missionary journey, he visited these places, planted churches, raised up leaders, came back to Jerusalem. He goes into uh, his second missionary journey. Uh, there's a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. And, and they, when they launch out, the second missionary journey was a powerful one where they uh, reached out in Philippi, Thessalon Thessalonica, Athens, Corinth, Greece, uh, Ephesus. And so all these wonderful places uh, where Paul was able to go in and um, really affect the community, affect the society. And in the midst of all of this, corruption and sexual immorality and all this sin, uh, Paul was able to uh, plant churches. Uh, right? Yesterday we looked at uh, the church at Corinth where uh, Corinth was a place where there was so much of uh, idols and uh, the goddess Aphrodite and a uh, thousand male prostitutes, thousand female prostitutes. And in that kind of a, you know, a place, Paul was able to raise up a church, raise up a community of believers. And we know uh, when we read uh, the book of Corinth is the Corinthian church was a church filled with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Right? That's why Paul writes uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, we may have all of these gifts, but if we do not have love, uh, we are just a sounding gong. Uh, so they were already flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. Right. Uh, and then let's continue on. Uh, at Corinth, we saw that uh, Paul also wrote the letter to the Thessalonians because what happened was 
uh, he finished in Thessalonica, he came into Corinth and some Maybe some people from outside came into the church and said, you know what, uh, the second coming has already happened or the raptures already happened. Um, and so we have missed it and things like that, new kinds of doctrines. And that's why Paul uh, stops at his track and begins to write first and second Thessalonians and uh, talks more about you know, the rapture and the second coming and what is to happen. So he encourages the church uh, through his letter. Uh, then we looked at uh, Ephesus as well, where Paul went to Ephesus. So let's let's pick up from here, right? So after Cor Corinth, uh, Paul goes into a place called Sencria, and uh, there he's got his two teammates, uh, the couple Aquila and Priscilla, and then from there, Sencera he goes into Ephesus. I'm on page 19 if you're following uh, your notes, right? Uh, he goes into Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is again a very important city of Asia Minor, right? Uh, the temple uh, of Diana in Ephesus was, uh, was, a, was a goddess there, which was also one of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, the temple was constructed with pure marble, Again, uh, just like Athens, it had uh, marbled uh, roads and uh, uh, constructions of big, uh, you know, palaces and uh, the temple, uh, you know, in Ephesus, it was like, uh, it was a harbor. So the seas, uh, the ships would come and, you know, take dock there and they would stay there for a couple of days or months, whatever. So it was a place of trade commerce, business, uh, again, a booming place. People would do uh, small businesses, big businesses. And uh, Paul gets into this kind of a place, very similar to Corinth, uh, where, you know, it's again a, a place of business with the goddess Aphrodite here, a place of business, goddess uh, Diana with uh, the multi-breasted goddess. Uh, and the Ephesians believe that this goddess fell from the sky and uh, once she fell from the sky, she began to, uh, you know, give out her gifts to the people. So Paul goes into Ephesus, goes into synagogues and preaches the gospel, right? Uh, after preaching there for some time, uh, he leaves Aquila and Priscilla there. Now, uh, most probably the church... Uh, you know, when, when we say sometime, it's not mentioned how long, but probably he stayed a month or so, planted the church, made Aquila and Priscilla, okay, you'll stay here, look after the church at Ephesus. And in, Aqu in Ephesus, Aquila and Priscilla meet this wonderful man named Apollos. And we read that in Acts chapter 18, 24 to 28. Could one of us please read that? Acts chapter 18, verses 24 to 28. Shall I read first? Yes, go ahead. Abhi. Acts chapter 18, verse 24 to 28 says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and, a, and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This man had been interested in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. The Aquila and Priscilla heard him they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Avni. So we see here, uh, now we need to, um, you know, one of the things I always tell my, uh, you know, the people that we teach and uh, 
uh, in Bible college over the last so many years, been teaching, uh, is to picture what you're studying, right? Uh, we, you know, God has given us imagination. So uh, one of the ways that, you know, I personally read the scripture is I picture what's happening, right? So uh, initially, when I began to study the book of Acts and Paul's journey, I was like, whoa, it's, you know, uh, I always thought the letters are all in order, but not so, you know, it, there's so many places, so many people. And I thought, how am I going to do this? And I began to picture, right? Of course, I made, uh, you know, uh, uh, I remember making this chart and maybe I, I would suggest and encourage you also, if you have time, go ahead and do it. Uh, you know, get a chart, uh, just, you know, do first, second, third and fourth, uh, just uh, divide it into four and just write down, okay, first journey, these are the people, these are the places uh, and these are the churches started, second journey. And so that way, uh, you know, we're picturing the whole thing. And so imagine you picture this, right? Uh, a small little church in Corinth, Apollos and, uh, sorry, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, a couple is there and Paul is there. Uh, they've started the church and Paul goes on from there. Uh, but Apollos, uh, Aquila and Priscilla meet this man named Apollos, who is, uh, who, you know, who was well versed with the word something like apostle paul himself right who was well versed with the word yet he did not know about the baptism of the holy spirit and he apollos became a powerful instrument in the ministry later on we see that um, uh, you know he accepted the teachings of uh, aquila and priscilla and later on from ephesus they sent him to corinth now in corinth Apollos did a powerful work. He was a great leader. He showed exemplary leadership skills. That is why when Paul writes his letter to the Corinth, he says, is Christ divided? Uh, you know, uh, some say they believe in Peter. Some say they believe in Paul. Some say they believe in Apollos. So the very fact that Apollos name comes in there along with such great leaders shows that Apollos was a wonderful preacher, wonderful, uh, uh, you know, ministry was done uh, through his life as well. So Apollos was a great blessing later on to the church in Corinth. Uh, but Paul has left Ephesus. Later on, he comes back to Ephesus. We will look at that. Uh, from Ephesus, Paul decides to go back to Caesarea, which is about uh, 50 to 60 miles from Jerusalem. Now, it took him 30 days covering 650 miles. Uh, uh, so just picture this. It's not like, you know, take a, take a flight or take a train and we're there the next day or a couple of days. No. 30 days, 650 miles. And uh, um, it could be that, you know, Paul writes his uh, trials and difficulties that he went through. It could be that, uh, you know, there were times, you know, he said, I went without food and without water. Um, I, I was shipwrecked, all of that. It, it could be that all of those things happened during these times uh, of his second missionary journey. So Paul goes to Jerusalem, greets the believers there, now, by this time, nobody is looking at Paul as a, you know, uh, uh, just a, uh, you know, just a small person. No, no. Now they know what Apostle Paul is because they've seen the fruit of his labor. Uh, uh, the first missionary journey and now the second missionary journey that has, he has, uh, you know, people have noticed the anointing of God upon his life. So he was very warmly welcomed into the church in, of Jerusalem. And uh, then from Jerusalem, Paul went back to his home church, which is Antioch of Syria. And that ended the whole second missionary journey. So second missionary journey had some wonderful places, but let's look at the high points of Paul's second missionary journey. A uh, couple of them. First was the ministry at Athens and in Corinth. Right? Uh, how Paul was able to go in the midst of these intellectuals uh, and bring the gospel to them, start a you know a church, a community of believers in the midst of this kind of a place, right? Two, he was 
you know, Paul was strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit, meaning he, he as a carrier of revival, uh, he was able to minister the word of God in wisdom and in power. Right. One of the things that we must learn as leaders and as people who are going to be in the ministry is where it's very important to walk in wisdom. Right. Uh, wisdom is important. Even in our ministry, in everything that we do, we need to walk in wisdom. It's not only about power. It's not only about authority and all of that, uh, but it's wisdom combined with power. And here, Paul, uh, he knew he was anointed of God, but he walked in wisdom. He knew how to minister, how to see a breakthrough in people's lives. And local communities were established. God's kingdom begin, began to advance in different places um, uh, as, as this uh, second missionary journey, you know, uh, just spread into Asia Minor and into Europe. Uh, now, one of the things that Paul understood was it was the real challenge of winning souls was was not, okay, you know, uh, 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 I have to speak this way or I have to do this and I have to do that. No, the real challenge was that the enemy has blinded their eyes. And so we as believers need to bring in the gospel and the gospel will, you know, unveil their eyes that they will come to know the truth. Uh, wherever Paul went, he preached Christ crucified. He preached the cross of Jesus Christ. And what Jesus did, the work of Jesus on the cross, that's all he preached, right? Uh, and after preaching, he ministered in signs, wonders, and miracles. Paul refused to engage in meaningless arguments and debates, right? Uh, here's an important thing that we should learn. Uh, choose your battles wisely, right? Choose your battles wisely. Now, as a, as a believer, as, you, as we all get opportunities in leadership, there will be challenges coming our way. And we don't run away from it. Right? We got to deal with these problems, deal with challenges, but choose your battles wisely. Right, uh, you know, in, in, in even in church here in the city of Mangalore, uh, we have a lot of young people, right? Uh, so a lot of them have many questions. They come and ask me all kinds of questions, and uh, uh, you know, there are times some questions uh, doesn't make sense. Like we won't say it doesn't make sense, but uh, some questions are, uh, you know, asked to trap you, or you know, they don't want to learn but they just ask you certain questions. And uh, I, one of the things that we should do is we should learn to choose our battles well. Right? If there's a something, if there's something that is, uh, you know, happened and, and it's out of your control and, and you've done all you can uh, to make things right, if still things haven't changed, move on, right? Uh, don't stick on to that, okay, he said this or she said this. What happens is it brings a blockage to what uh, God is calling us to. So, so it's very important to choose uh, battles. Just a sidetrack there. Okay, so after that, uh, Paul is in Antioch, his home church. He's, he's resting, probably taking some time off, thinking about the churches, thinking about where to go next. Uh, and Peter came to Antioch, right? So from Jerusalem, Peter comes to Antioch and he eats with the um, uh, Gentiles and uncircumcised, he eats with them. Uh, but as soon as uh, a few more people, the brothers of Jerusalem came to Antioch, Peter withdrew from the Gentiles and he sat with the Jews. Right now, Paul openly confronted Peter and said, this, what you're doing is unbiblical behavior. Right. And later on, Peter himself also uh, realized it and he knew it. So so that marks the end of the second missionary journey. Now, let's go into the third missionary journey. Now, the third missionary journey lasted for about four years, traveling 2,500 miles. OK, I got a question from Dinesh. Paul had his hair cut off because he had taken a vow. 
this verse doesn't mention what wow and why yes so dinesh uh, thank you for that question yes it does not mention what wow it is most likely that uh, you know it was the feast during the feast at that time uh, uh, you know people take vows now remember that uh, uh, at this time paul was in jerusalem he came to jerusalem at the time of the feast so the feast could be the feast of the passover it could be the uh, uh, feast of the unleavened bread so certain people take vows right uh, now remember that paul was uh, uh, you know studied under gamaliel he was a pharisee he is a pharisee and uh, so he just took a vow saying you know let me maybe it was a personal thing to him like it's like this right uh, now if we want to do something if we want to do something uh, personally it, it it is not a force upon people right now paul even if he didn't do it not a big deal but i believe that he did this so that he could show that he still respects the law because many uh, you know he the jews may have thought okay this guy doesn't want the law but it was also a physical demonstration yes he still respects any and the law is important and also second reason could be that he wanted to you know uh, uh, just uh, you know grow closer to god it was again not not through the works but uh, just a way of saying that okay god i'm i'm still there i'm still uh, desire more of you and so he took this vow to uh, cut his hair uh, so mostly uh, the nation they do this uh, cutting of hair before certain festivals so yes uh, it does not mention what vow maybe it was a personal thing of uh, paul's choice uh, uh, samuel uh, could be the could it be the nazarite vow um again uh, the nazarite vow includes a lot of things uh, uh, lot lots of things uh, involved uh, but it could be because we know that paul was uh, uh, you know zealous very zealous uh, uh, in 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 and zealous for the scriptures zealous for the god uh, of abraham and so uh, it could be the nazarite vow but it also could be just a vow that he has taken personally right so we can't say okay it is this uh, because there's no mention of it so uh, yeah but there it was a vow that he had taken uh, it was just i'm sure the the jews would have thought hey paul is cut his hair he's taken a vow uh, they would have thought you know, maybe they would have respected him even more for what he's done uh, and uh, it was also to show that hey it's not that i have abandoned the law it's just that God, christ jesus fulfilled that law so uh, yes yeah, so that uh, thing okay uh, so we finished off the second missionary journey once again many places uh, many people uh, many churches planted right uh, first and second missionary journey uh, but we see a, a pattern which paul is working in right um, go to a place preach the gospel start a church raise up leaders move on right so that's what he kept on doing uh, uh, and here go, he goes into his third missionary journey four years uh, this third missionary journey 2500 miles uh, now on the first two journeys paul went to new places right planted churches but on the third journey paul did not go to any new place uh, but he went about strengthening the churches that are already existing now as i mentioned we should remember this it's not that these are the only churches that paul started right uh, there could have been plenty of other churches so uh, so he in the third missionary journey he went to many places strengthening the existing churches right uh, so from antioch of syria paul departed he went to galatia remember uh, the first missionary journey the churches in galatia he goes there he meets all of them he uh, he talks to them and all of it uh, strengthens the church now this is his third visit to galatia if you remember the first missionary journey he goes through galatia plants the churches comes back 
the same way in the second missionary journey. So that's the second visit. And then now he goes there. So this is the third visit. Uh, and then from there, from Galatia, he goes to Ephesus. He chooses Ephesus. Now, in Ephesus, he stays for three full years. Never has Paul stayed in a place for so long, but he stays uh, three full years in Ephesus. He preached in the synagogue for about three months. Then what he did was there was a school, uh, school of Tyrannus in Ephesus where he would go and preach the gospel day after day, teaching them the word, teaching them uh, the things of the scriptures. And the Bible says that many people uh, accepted the Lord, the word of God spread. And uh, that is why later on, if we see in Ephesus, the church has grown already where it has leaders, it had bishops, it has overseers, it had deacons, right? So it, it looked like a well-established church compared to the church in, uh, you know, uh, Thessalonica or the church in Philippi. Uh, this church in Ephesus, because Paul spent three years there, um, he, 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 you know, set things right in Ephesus. Now, uh, the seven churches mentioned in um, uh, Revelations chapter 2 and 3, uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, uh, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea were all from this Asia Minor region, right? And it's most likely that all of these churches, uh, some uh, uh, Bible scholars say that all these churches were started by Apostle Paul so because uh, it was complete of Asia Minor and it was started during that time by Paul. So it could be that Paul, uh, you know, went about to these other places also, but it's not mentioned, right? And in Ephesus, Paul did wonderful miracles, unusual miracles, handkerchiefs brought healing of Paul people, um, uh, the sons of Sceva, in Acts 19, uh, they tried to do an exorcism, and that failed exorcism, uh, uh, the devil overpowers them and uh, beats them up where the sons of Sceva, they run home naked. Uh, now, that brought a lot of fear into people, and many people accepted the message of the gospel. People repented. They turned away from black magic. If you read Acts 19, they brought everything to the center, like, you know, all this black magic and all the books. They brought it to the center and they burnt it. Uh, and so there was a strong work established in Ephesus. Uh, and I believe it's because of those three years that Paul was there, just making sure that the word is well established in the city of Ephesus. Uh, then at Ephesus, Paul raised up many leaders, right? Uh, uh, and again, uh, he met Philemon in Ephesus and Epaphras, both from the city of Colossae. Now, here's an interesting fact. Um, Paul never went to the church in Colossae. Right, uh, there was no. He never went to Colossae, right? But Epaphras was with Paul in Ephesus, right? So Epaphras goes back to his hometown Colossae and starts the church. So later on, uh, when Paul comes to Ephesus, uh, Epaphras comes to meet him and then gives an account of what happens in the church. And that is when Paul sits down to write the letter at the church in Colossae. So uh, he had not seen the people. He has not been to Colossae, uh, but he writes this letter. And that even Titus worked with Paul in Ephesus, who later on went to Crete and started his own uh, 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 church there. So, so after establishing the work in Ephesus, after three years, uh, Paul, he planned to go into Macedonia and uh, then again go to Jerusalem and stay there for a while. Uh, and while at Ephesus, Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians, right? So remember that uh, when he was coming on starting his third missionary journey, he first goes through Galatia, right? Now, what happened was he doesn't stay in Galatia for too long. But after he comes to Ephesus, he writes a letter saying, why are you going back to the law? Why are you going back to circumcision? I could not address that matter when I was there. But now that I'm here, uh, 
you know, it's a strong letter, the first three chapters. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has come in between? And, uh, you know, why have you brought the law when grace and truth is in through Jesus Christ? I heard that some of you are getting circumcised. Um, and so he writes this strong letter uh, from uh, Ephesus. And he also writes uh, to the Corinthians. Uh, the church had many, many problems. So he writes a letter to the Corinthians as well. So if you look at the third missionary journey, it was not like the first and two. The first one, he went about place to place, starting churches. Second one, the same thing. Third one, he went strengthening the churches, stays three years in Ephesus. He writes letters to the churches of uh, 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 Galatians and the first Corinthians. And it was more of a, a, a time of uh, you know exhorting the, the church, encouraging the church, building up what he has already established, right? Uh, so we see that Paul had a wonderful balance. Right? He didn't just start churches, give it to somebody and walk away. No, he wanted to see them grow. He wanted to see them built in the faith in Jesus Christ. And, uh, and you know, that's why Paul writes in his last letter, uh, he writes, you are my crown, right? Uh, in heaven. You are my crown. You are my rejoicing in heaven. So Paul is saying, when I go up to heaven, it's not about, I can't go up to Jesus and say, okay, Lord, you know my work, first missionary journey, second, third, the fourth one also, and you know what all I've done, all the miracles. No. Paul says, my crown in heaven are you, the people. So here's an important thing. An important point to remember is the sign of a great leader is, is how many leaders he's able to raise. That's the sign of a great leader. Sign of a great leader is not, uh, okay, uh, how many sermons you can preach, how well you can preach, or uh, you know, all that is important, uh, or uh, how many places you have gone to preach and uh, uh, you know how, how, how much of uh, in-depth revelation we have in the word of God. No, the sign of a great preacher is how many leaders, sorry, a sign of a great leader is how many leaders you are able to raise up. That's why Paul says, you are my crown. You people are the crown for me in heaven. Uh, and so uh, now Paul goes on from Ephesus. He goes into Macedonia. Right. Remember uh, the second missionary journey during the Macedonian call, the Holy Spirit stopped him. But later on, he goes into Macedonia. And while at Macedonia, Paul writes his second missionary journey. Uh, and uh, Paul suffered greatly in, uh, 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 at Macedonia. People did not accept his message. People tried to persecute him. They also, there was an S. I wouldn't say assassin's threat, but they planned to kill him. Uh, but Titus came and, uh, you know, brought reports of the church at Corinth and he was happy. Uh, and then from Macedonia, Paul traveled to Greece. Now, it could be that he went to Athens, the first place where uh, in the second missionary journey. And it also could be that after Athens, he stayed a while in Corinth as well. Uh, and, and in Athens... Uh, he wrote the letter to the Romans, right? Uh, and, and then from there, uh, Paul went into another small city uh, of Macedonia called Traos, where Eutychus, we learn of that account, Acts chapter 20, 9 to 12. Uh, could one of us please read that, please? Uh, Acts 20, verses 9 to 12. Acts 20, verses 9 to 12. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the story, from the third story, and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him, said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while, even till daybreak he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and there were 
not a little comforted. Yep. Thank you, Samuel. So the reason we read this passage was because now Paul is well advanced in ministry, right? And, uh, you know, he kept talking, kept talking about the scriptures, teaching the scriptures to the people. And this young man sitting on a window uh, fell into a deep sleep, fell to the ground, and he died. Now, look at Paul's reaction, right? Uh, he didn't say, let's call for a fasting prayer. Let's call for all of them. Come on, let's pray and hold hands. Uh, nothing. All he said was, don't worry. Don't worry, he's not dead. His life is in him. Paul just goes, lays on him. He comes back to life. They carry him. They go. He goes up, eats. And Paul continues to preach until daybreak. It is so, it's so, you know, it's so, the miracles were so common to Paul's life, right? Uh, that that it, it did not disturb him at all. He was, don't worry, everything's fine. You know, God is able to bring him back to life. So you see the, the, the level of anointing that Paul has reached, uh, that he was able to, you know, in so much power, in so much of authority, he was in complete control of the situation, right? Later on uh, in the next, during the final journey, you know, uh, Paul is taken captive into Rome. We will study about that. Uh, there's a book that I read uh, uh, where it's, it mentions that the captive of the ship became the captain of the ship. Paul was taken captive. He had chains on his hand and legs. But he's calling the shots in the ship. He's saying, as long as you don't jump off, as long as you stay within this, you will live. And they listen to him. So that's what the anointing of God can do, right? Uh, so it's powerful. You know, miracles, signs and wonders was a normal activity during Paul's ministry. And that's what we should also pray for we should uh, you know desire even as we go about preaching and maybe ministering to people and sharing the gospel wherever we can uh, we are to confirm it with signs wonders and miracles you may think okay but i don't have the gift of healing or i don't have the gift of prophecy the gift of word of knowledge uh, we have to desire it. We have to pray for it. We have to pray and ask God, God, give me this. Uh, spark this revival inside me. Spark an outpouring inside. Outpour your Holy Spirit inside me that from, from me it can just pour out to people around us. And that should be our desire. right? Uh, so Paul did that. Paul went on from Ephesus, uh, sorry, from uh, Travos, uh, uh, he went to a place called Miletus, which is uh, probably about 28 to 30 miles from Ephesus. Now, this is a very, very sad account. Uh, it's a long verse, Acts 20, 17 to 38. Uh, he met the elders on, of Ephesus in Miletus. So he said, he probably sent message, said, all the elders, deacons, leaders, come to Miletus uh, and meet me. And he gives a powerful message in Acts 20, 17 to 38. Uh, he says, okay, this is probably the last time you're going to see me. Um, and he gives him a powerful message. He says, stay on with the word, preach the word, declare his word, and uh, you know, uh, raise up leaders to this. And he gives a whole uh, detail on what you should do. Um, it is a sad account when we read it because they knew that it is going to be the last time they would see Paul and uh, he will be taken as a prisoner later on um, in Caesarea and then in Rome. So Paul meets with the leaders at Ephesus. They have a very emotional uh, farewell. Paul goes on from uh, Ephesus straight to Caesarea. And from Caesarea, he goes on to Jerusalem. And at Jerusalem, uh, uh, Paul had been warned but he visits Jerusalem. He goes to the temple with, uh, you know, Jewish, few of the Jewish converts. And a riot broke out. They seized Paul. 
they said this man is bringing people uh, into the temple uh, and they are jewish converts so the roman soldiers had to come intervened arrested him uh, paul was escorted off paul was imprisoned for 2 years during this time right under governor felix uh, but here's the thing even the governors governor felix governor festus king agrippa paul was able to share the gospel to them as well right uh, i think it was uh, 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 governor felix who said are you trying to make me one of your converts meaning he was almost he almost believed the message that paul shared right and then he finally appeals to caesar's palace sorry caesar's court and uh, uh, which meant that he would go before the emperor and stand now as a roman citizen Paul had this, uh, would say, uh, uh, this opportunity uh, to go to Rome and stand in front of Nero. Uh, uh, more so, more than an opportunity, he had the privilege because he was a Roman citizen. Uh, uh, so he said, "I appeal to Caesar," and um, he, and so they had to take him from Caesarea uh, to Rome, and that's why Paul writes to the Romans. uh if we read he says in the last passage of romans first time i read that i was like wow what is this man capable of doing he says greet the people in caesar's household greet the believers who are in caesar's household so he has been able to you know bring in the gospel to caesar's household also people in caesar's house were believers and you know Paul did such an impact in that place as well. Now they were getting ready. They have to take Paul to Rome. So Luke was with Paul at the end of his third missionary journey, and so when he when he said, "I want to go to, uh, I want to go in front of Caesar," I appeal to Caesar. Paul, Luke, and another person called Aristocus, uh, Aristocus uh, went with Paul, uh, and so. imprisoned in rome paul wrote four epistles they are called the prison epistles colossians philippians ephesians and philemon right uh, four prison epistles that was written uh, now as we mentioned paul himself was not at colosse but uh news came back from epaphras regarding the church so most probably he wrote this letter there uh, his fellow prisoner uh philemon uh uh sorry uh, his fellow prisoner uh, onesimus was a runaway slave of philemon and paul is saying okay now he has you know uh, if we read the letter of philemon he says paul is saying take him back uh he is a good servant he has been helpful to me he has you know accepted my uh, message and uh, his ways have changed accept him back uh, like you would accept me so uh again that is a very emotional letter uh, philemon he writes to him and says accept onesimus back because he uh, worked with me and put his life in danger for my sake as well uh, then timothy also was with paul during this time of the roman imprisonment uh, and high ranking officials guards people in the uh, palace people uh, all kinds of people who came to meet apostle paul were impacted uh during paul's time so uh he was imprisoned in rome then he was released for a, for a bit uh paul was released after he was released he wrote first timothy titus and then after a while he was imprisoned again which is his second imprisonment now during this imprisonment he knew that his time was the uh, coming to an end uh Paul sits down to write one of the most powerful letters um uh, farewell messages you know uh second timothy is a powerful letter which paul writes now if you and i were in our last days and we know uh you know we're going to pass away uh, time has come for us we would be so worried about you know things that we have to do okay let me do this let me do this paul's worry was only one thing spread the message spread the gospel he sits he knew that ephesus was a place that needed some more help 
uh, Timothy was young, uh, he was probably worried. Will he be able to handle the issues? These overseers, bishops, everyone are there, but they are much elder in age. Will Timothy be able to look after? He sits down. He writes. He says, uh, in, in that whole letter, if you read Second Timothy, he says, uh, Timothy, I've fought the good fight. Now you preach the word. You know, uh, don't let your age uh, look down upon you. Don't let people look down upon you because of your age and all of that. And uh, and, and so this was his last letter uh, uh, that Paul wrote. And somewhere about maybe 66 to 68 AD, Paul was martyred. Tradition has it that he was beheaded. Now, here is a summary of what Apostle Paul did. 20 to 24 years of ministry, one, two, three, four missionary journeys, 49 cities and towns across Asia Minor, traveled 10,000 miles uh, uh, by land and several thousand miles by sea, established believing communities, raised up many leaders who can take the same fire into different places, was able to minister cross cultures, cross social, social lines, rich and poor, educated, uneducated. He impacted cities, marketplaces, high places. He impacted every place that he went. Why? Because that revival fire was an outpouring from his life. So you and I just want to encourage each one of us, even as I was preparing this, uh, I remember just two days back, I was preparing the, the second missionary journey and I started to tear up. I said, how much this man has done and, the, and so much of sacrifice that he has gone through, so much of difficulties, challenges. How was he able to do it? You know, um, Leonard Ravenhill in his book writes, if I could do 1% of what Apostle Paul did, that would be a great work now. And many people write that, you know, when Apostle Paul wore his boots, he, he did what all the 12 disciples did together. He did it alone. Why? Because of that spark that happened many years ago, uh, about 17, 18 years ago at Damascus. That revival fire kept growing, growing, and growing in his heart. So let us press for revival. We are to welcome the Holy Spirit uh, uh, to move in our midst. Let us prepare to be a community uh, saturated with God. Right? Let us set ablaze communities. Now we may think, I, uh, nobody knows me, nobody, how can I uh, be impact a whole city? Remember Apostle Paul, when he went into Athens, nobody knew him. When he went into Ephesus, nobody knew him. He went alone, right? Maybe the in Ephesus, there's an account that only two or three people believed, right? In Corinth as well, maybe only four or five people believed, but he started with that and the church began to grow, right? So never despise small beginnings that God uh, sets for us. So let us all become carriers of revival in whatever sphere of influence God has placed us in. Right? Uh, so we come to an end of Paul's missionary journey. I know that it was a lot of content. Uh, we may not remember all of it, uh, but I encourage you go back and you know uh, read through and learn you will be learning also in the coming semesters uh, from the book of acts uh, but i encourage you go back read it uh, it will really stir up something in your heart and my heart as well so uh, so we will close for today any any questions any thoughts anybody has thank you pastor paul for that one God, I, I just want to ask a question maybe i might have a mystic class and I didn't know um, or someone has asked before um, for Paul um, history says that he was both Jew and um, Roman 
And so his name was Saul because he was Jewish and Roman. He was a Roman. That's why his name was Paul. Is that true? Yes, that is that is absolutely true. Yes, so he was a, a Roman citizen. Uh, yes, and uh, a, a Pharisee, a Jew, a Jew with Roman citizen, and also he mentions in a place that uh, uh, you know uh, during those times you pay a huge sum to buy Roman citizenship to have privileges. Uh, but Paul says there, no, uh, you know when they take him. When they arrest him, he says, "No, I was born a citizen." So, uh, so yes, that's true. So that means this cancels the. Um, I don't know. We've been here for a long time. Growing up as a child, we always heard, "Oh, when Paul was a Pharisee, he was Saul. Then he changed to Paul <laughs> because he became a Christian." So that cancels that, that statement. Correct. Yes, that that is not true. Uh, you know, we had that thing. Okay, he's a Saul turned to Paul. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that is just a saying. But uh, uh, you know, it's it's the same name. It's the same. Uh, it's just Perfect. that one is a Roman name, one is a Jewish name. So uh, yes. So then the last thing then would it be also just um, would it be right to kind of say the reason he identifies more with. Paul was just basically because of his ministry towards the Gentile nations. Yes. Would that be correct to say? Yes. So when Paul, so if we read uh, in the initial, when Paul was going to Damascus, uh, the Lord Jesus himself specified and said, uh, I have shown him he will be a light to the Gentiles. So uh, just like all of us have certain kinds of gifts and calling, Paul's call was more towards the Gentiles, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and if you see the ministry of Peter and Matthew and all of them, their calling was more towards the Jews and people accepted his message. But even Paul did share the message to the Jews, but all they wanted to do was to kill him. Uh, yeah. So he just moved on. He said, okay, God has anyway called me to the uh, Gentiles, so I will continue uh, ministering there. So yeah. So his ministry was focused more towards the Gentiles, yes. So that's why there was more fruit there compared to the Jews. So Yeah, so yeah, I, I, I understand that. What I was asking was, do you think he identified more as his name as Paul to the Gentiles, because we, we notice a change. We start hearing Paul after the Damascus experience. Before Damascus experience, it was Saul. Saul, Saul, Saul. So, so. so would, would it be fair to just say, just to identify, he, he kind of presented himself as Paul, and people knew him as Paul rather than more Saul. Yes, yes, that would be right. Say, just for people to also identify, okay. Uh, I am here. I'm, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm ministering to the Gentiles. Uh, so yes, to identify with the people as well. Yes, okay. that could also be uh, another reason. So, okay. uh, so if you see that uh, after the whole encounter at Antioch, when Barnabas comes, after he comes into, uh, Barnabas brings. Uh, he, it says that he went and searched for Saul of Tarsus and he brings him to Antioch. After that uh, is when they were first time called him Apostle. And, and from then on, it is Apostle Paul. Uh, so, yes, he must have purposefully used Paul so that he could identify with the Gentiles. So, okay. yes, thank you. Thank my, you. Last, my last question, sorry. I don't know. Um, I know. I, I know there was a sharp argument which you discussed last time, and he did ask for John Mark. I'm sorry, Mark to be sent back to him. But really, nothing was really. There's no information telling us that um, the, the whatever disagreement between Barnabas and Paul was settled. I don't know if history kind of covers that, or is there any extra biblical material that kind of like. Uh, maybe explains whereby maybe they met again, or we, do we know? Do we know if that argument or disagreement, you know, the way would settle it? I don't know. What do you think? Yes. So, say there is no uh, additional material uh, to prove that okay, the thing was resolved, the, the conflict. But here's the thing: later on, Paul, uh, you know, he writes to the Corinthians and he uh, he recommends Barnabas. He says. 
Barnabas, uh, is it only I and Barnabas who should go through these troubles as leaders, as apostles? So he, he counts Barnabas as an apostle as well. So we see through that that there is no misunderstanding, right? Uh, Paul is lifting up Barnabas. Uh, and also uh, to John Mark, he says, uh, you know, bring John Mark. He's of help to me. He's of help to the ministry as well. So, uh, so there is no account additional writing, but from what we can read in these two passages, we can see that, you know, all is well with uh, Barnabas and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas, uh, even John Mark as well. So thank you very much okay, thank, you. thank you okay we have almost come sorry you have only three minutes to get into your other class thank you so much for joining us uh please feel free to go ahead and join your other class uh, have a great week ahead god bless thank you pastor god bless you too